And speaking of music legends, Graham Nash is co-founder of both the Hollies and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young. He's a two-time rock and roll fame inductee and he's been lighting up the world's music stage for over half a century. He's recently released a new studio album called Now and the tireless musician has also just started a UK tour, 60 Years of Songs and Stories. It includes a show in Glasgow in three weeks from now and it promises music from across his career and plenty of anecdotes. He's got plenty of them. They're sure to include tribute to David Crosby, memories of his time with Joni Mitchell and reflections on reconnecting with his Hollies bandmate Alan Clark. I spoke to Graham not long before his tour began and he shared a few tales. We'll hear them after a blast of Crosby, Stills and Nash. Just a song that she was gone First of all, um, Graham, I'm obviously really looking forward to hearing songs, not just from your back catalogue, but particularly from your new album, Now Live in Glasgow. You've said it's your most personal album to date, and that is saying something. Did you realise it was going to be so close to your heart when you started writing it? No, not when I started, but when I had uh, four or five love songs to my wife, Amy, I knew that, that I was wearing my heart on both sleeves. So you knew at that point that was the way the album was going. Give us a yes. sense of where and how you wrote the record. Where were you in the world? What's the time period of the songs? Do you have a writing discipline or a particular room that you use? No, my room is in my head. I'm constantly thinking about music. I'm constantly thinking about new songs. I am a musician. I'm now 81 years old and I feel incredibly passionate about music still. And I'm really looking forward to come and playing in Glasgow. We used to play at Barrowlands Ballroom. What are your memories of that? Crowded, hot, sweaty, hundreds and hundreds of people, people fainting and being carried out on people's shoulders. Yeah, it was, Barrowlands Ballroom was a wild gig. It still is, I've got to tell you that. Although I don't see so many people uh, fainting these days. I think health and safety has maybe pulled up its um, socks a little bit. Right, right. <laughs> so the title track from your new album right now is very much rooted in your life, your love, your time in the present, and you evidently still love rocking out as well. Is it important to celebrate that and to remind us that life is a trip, whatever age we are? Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. Life is a trip, and no matter where we are in the world, our life is made up of choices. Do I turn left? Do I turn right? Do I talk to him? Do I talk to her? Your life is whatever choices you have made. And fortunately, I believe that I have made the correct choices for me in my life. I always thought I really knew what I was doing. And you're still fired up by social justice or unjustice. Uh, absolutely. As well. Absolutely. I have to feel something deeply before I start to write. And what, once I hear something or I, I see something or I do something, you know, that strikes a chord within my mind, I'm off. I have countless uh, melodies that I have written and countless lyrics that I have written. And in my mind, once they, I go, oh, wait a second, the rhythm mm. of that lyrical line fits a melody and so now I've got a new song happening and that that's basically what happens but I have to feel something first yeah yeah that feels like it's always been at the heart of your songwriting and your performance we also have to mention from the new album now Buddy's Back which was written with your Holly's bandmate and school friend Alan Clark what was it like to join forces again it was unbelievable for me. You know, when I when I heard me and David and Stephen sing and realised I would have to leave the Hollies, I understood how tragic it would be for my friend Alan, you know. Mm. We've known each other since we were six. Uh, we've done a lot of singing together. And uh, he lost his voice, as you know. He left the Hollies 20 years ago. Mm. And then he called me about eight months ago and he says, you know, I found my voice. Wow. I want to make a solo record. I said, that's fantastic, Alan, and any help I can give, just ask. He said, well, I have these two songs I want you to consider putting your voice on. And if you like them, would you do that and send them back to me? I heard the songs. I liked them. I put my voice on. I sent them back. And what does Alan do? He sends me another two songs. <laughs> and, now, and now I'm on 10 songs of his solo record. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 
isn't that so lovely though that that friendship and that chemistry and that love of m music is still there can you take us back to your early days with Alan and, and the Hollies when did you first start making music together and did you realise that you had something special or as uh, is said in Buddy's Back that there's something was there in the stars yeah, Buddy's Back is a song I wrote for Alan's album, and I liked it enough to put it on my record, of course. Um, it is about our love for Buddy Holly. I mean, we were the Hollies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, easy to figure out. I remember when we were young and hot. Style and we let it go. We did love Buddy Holly a great deal, and we realized... Uh, very early on in our career that if you could play three or four chords on a guitar, you could probably play most Buddy Holly songs. Mm. They were incredibly simple, very direct, straight to the heart, and he was one of us. He wasn't like Elvis, you know, slicking his hair back and shaking his ass. He was a regular guy, and uh, we recognised that, and, and I was very pleased to be able to help Alan with his album. Yeah, quite, and uh, all those years before being inspired. Can you remember, Graham, when you first heard one of your songs on the radio? I can remember the exact moment. Wow. The Hollies were doing a, a show in early 63 on the BBC. We were walking towards the BBC uh, studio, and we passed a store that had a, their front window broken. And there were two workmen putting in a huge shop window. And by their feet, they had a small transistor radio. And as we walked by, our first record came on. Oh, wow. And we heard ourselves on the BBC, on the street in London. And it was an unbelievable moment for us because we realized at that moment that we had made it. There we were on the BBC, and it's coming out of their radio right there. <laughs> and that was an incredible moment for us. Yeah, I can only imagine, and I love it was on the street in London. But you did, of course, move to America. Did you always have a sense that you might musically move on from the Hollies or that you might move to the States? Was there anything that particularly drew you? Yeah. I'd written a song called King Midas in Reverse. Hmm. And I thought we made a very decent record of it. Kind of psychedelic, but it was a very decent record. But unfortunately, it only got into the top 30 immediately instead of the top 10, which is normally what the Holly singles did, you know. Yeah. And so the Holly started to uh, not trust my musical energy. And I'd written this song called Marrakesh Express. I like the song, and uh, the, in somewhere in the, in the bowels of uh, of the tape library at uh, Abbey Road in London is a track of the Hollies doing Marrakesh Express, but it leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> and so between those two things, I was very unhappy with the Hollies. And then I heard me and David and Stephen sing, and that was it. Yeah. I realized I would have to go back and leave the Hollies and leave everything and follow that sound. It's utterly incredible to think of the moment at which your three voices came together. Uh, Graham, can you take yeah. us into that room now? Can you tell us what that felt like? Because even to read about it or to think about it feels utterly magical. I had left uh, the last show in, uh, that the Hollies did in London. It was at the London Palladium. It was a, a, a children's benefit. And, you know, I, I realised that what we did was, was magical. And here's what happened. We were in uh, Joni's living room. I had, I had left London, uh, you know, after the last Holly show, and I want you to spend some time with Joan. Uh, I got to the car park uh, of her house, and there were other voices in there, which kind of pissed me off a little. You know, I, w I just wanted to spend time with Joan. <laughs> but it was David and Stephen, and they were having dinner with Joni. Oh, my goodness. And after dinner, after dinner, David looked at Stephen. He said, hey, play Willie that song that we were working on. Now, David had been thrown out of the birds and the Buffalo Springfield had broken up and they were trying to work on an Everly Brothers kind of duo kind of thing. And so they sang this song and it was a song called You Don't Have to Cry, which mm. was on the first Crosby, Stills and Nash record. And they sang it. They looked at me. I said, wow, first of all, Stephen, that's an incredibly great song. That's just wonderful sing it again. They looked at each other, they shrugged, they sang it again. When they got to the end of the second time, I said, okay, 
I'm a pretty decent harmony singer. I've learned my part. I know the words. I know David's body language. I I knew when Stephen was going to start and end a phrase. I'm good at what I do. I've been doing it for 50 years, you know, Mm -hmm. by that time. They sang it the third time, and after 45 seconds, we had to stop and start laughing. We had never heard a vocal sound like me and David and Stephen making our three voices into one voice. Oh, my goodness. And uh, we knew that the Hollies and the Birds and the Springfield were decent harmony bands, but this was something completely different. And also, you uh, have an audience of one, and that's Joni Mitchell, is that right? That's right. She was the only witness. In the morning, when you rise, My goodness me, it's just incredible to think, isn't it, all of those years ago, walking into that room, feeling a little bit jaded at first that there were other guys in the house and then the magic that followed. You never know what's going to happen, do you? You, you just never know, and I've, I've always uh, loved that about life. You just never know, if you make the right choices, what happens to you, yes. Yeah, but what's it like now when you sit down and you look back on those times? Does it feed in a little bit to the feeling of your songs, or do you try and always look forward and look at what your life is now? I'm not interested in what happened in the past. Yeah. There's nothing we can do about it. So we have to keep moving forward, and that's what I'm doing with my life. I'm moving forward constantly. And there's always music going on in your head. Always. <laughs> so what's it like bringing these songs to life then? You're coming over to Scotland. Obviously, we're delighted. You've played here so many times with Crosby, Stills and Nash and with the Hollies and Solo. Are you bringing a band this time? What's it going to be like for us? There'll be three of us on stage. Mm-hmm. Me, of course, with my guitar and harmonica and piano. We have uh, Shane Fontaine on guitar. I've been making music with Shane for at least 15 years, and Todd Caldwell is my piano player. So it'll be the three of us on stage, so it'll be, you know, solo voice and and three voices and lots of music. And I just finished uh, the second tour of this year about a week and a half ago. Every show was sold out. Everybody was having a delightful time. It is my pleasure to make music for them. I want them to know two things. One... I want to be there making music for them. I'm not going to phone it in. I'm not going to do it half-assed. I'm going to do it with the same passion I had when I wrote those songs. And secondly, I want my uh, audience to know that they will hear songs from the Hollies, from Crosby, Stills and Nash, from me solo, from me and David, from, you know, they're going to hear a lot of great music that they want to hear. Yeah, new songs as well. Uh, You've just reminded me of something that happened at the very, very start of... A lockdown, Graham, which was we did this show, I think it was a Friday afternoon and over here in the UK and certainly in Scotland, it was a day where everything was closing, so the schools were going to close everyone was going home from work, it was a very very strange afternoon and we were asking listeners to get in touch with songs that they wanted to hear and obviously a lot of us were looking to the fact that we were going to have to try and educate our kids, we were going to have to homeschool them and we weren't really feeling very equipped and so many listeners got in touch and asked for teach your children And in that moment, we got messages saying people had to pull their cars over. People were quite overwhelmed. You never know when a song is going to land in a completely different way, do you? And how much it can mean to people. Uh, Absolutely. Somebody uh, called me about a year and a half ago saying that they were in Kathmandu in Nepal in a small tea house there. And in that tea house, they had a jukebox and teacher children was playing loud. And I knew then that teacher children was going to be a piece of music that will last much longer than my physical body will will last. And I I just hope that uh, it brings pleasure to people after I'm gone. And that's what music is. It's such an incredible form of communication. I'm so pleased to be a musician. And I, you know, I'm now, as I said, 81 years old and I still feel incredibly healthy and incredibly passionate about music. Yeah, always writing, always rocking. Graham Nash, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Always. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you. Teach Your Children here on BBC Radio Scotland, a classic from Crosby, Stills and Nash, written by Graham Nash. You heard me talking to him just before that song. His new album now is out now.
course it is. And he's also live at Glasgow Royal Concert Hall on the 21st of September.